Variety pack. All right. Yeah, I'm getting um, on no fucking ciders. We're, we're rolling. Uh, Joe Learn D. Podcast, podcast episode 73. This is Alex Caravan, director of data science. See that red Ripping bar? A this is Queasy Rider. Yeah, means. That red bar means that Caravan just peaked every yeah. mic in this room. <laughs> means the, means I'm is, popular, dude. Means I'm a popular what, host. What he does on K- every Kyle, show. take it away. Kyle, not Lindley Wasserberger. Uh, not Pulse product manager. Currently just. B- Burger s- product manager. Yeah. I was trying to keep no. <laughs> cool. Something up cool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we replaced uh, replaced Kyle Lindley with Kyle Wasserberger. Uh, Lindley's out of town. I'm I'm Anthony Brady, director of sports science, driveline baseball, primary host of the R and D research and drinks podcast, and we have another guest too. And I am David Besky, little coordinator. Closer. Oh, yeah, there we go. You're getting it. Uh, driveline baseball. Where, where should I pick up? Just from the beginning. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, let the right. people know. On the microphone. Oh, yeah. That's money right um, there. David Besky, uh, coordinator of player development analytics. Oh. Um, former data scientist, still working under this guy, um, doing data science type stuff, um, but with a little bit more focus on kind of player development stuff recently. Yeah. Okay. So now, now we got to put out the R&D reorg post before Monday. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's uh, go. Yeah, so uh, Lindley's, um, Lindley's out of town. He's remote. It was actually his birthday on Wednesday. Uh, Happy Wednesday. birthday. Wednesday, Monday. I meant Monday. Yeah. I don't know why I said Wednesday. Today's Wednesday. Yeah, birthday Birthday was on Monday. Um, Lindley's, Lindley's working remotely, so we don't have him, but we did a little Kyle upgrade, get Wasserberger on the pod. Um, yeah, this is going to be a bit of a switch up from the other episodes. Yeah. I mean, we, we've been doing like a lot of interviews, you know, had some people from the skill side come in uh now we're now we're back on our nerd shit, we, we were so. just going for cloud though we had oge yeah. jakes those guys don't actually know anything yeah, you know yeah, what exactly. I'm saying? we were just like they have yeah. a lot of followers like now we're actually yeah. talking underground yeah. r&d guys yeah. if i was about to redo that 64 man tournament mm-hmm. weeds yeah weeds yeah. are yeah. what we're gonna be getting you guys would probably too. be looking at second round exits probably yeah. i'll be honest <laughs> second round exit at best i think i had a second round exit yeah. Yeah. last time uh oh really who'd you beat first round i don't know what, what was the uh, been, yeah. what if, was the cap? Yeah, like, been, <laughs> well, no, no, no. Was the cap twenty five hundred or five k? Five k, five k, five k. Yeah, I still if got if plenty we had a of cap room. at one k. Got, got a better shot there. <laughs> that's on, that sounds like a pretty good point. I, I'm down to if I'm going to redo that, I, I just got to go brackets. even more restrictive. But then you have no uh, driveline employees. No, I, I had a couple. I had a oh, couple. You do with March Madness. Oh yeah, yeah. That's a good point. That's a good point. Opportunity to get it out. Yeah, get it out soon. So yeah, this episode's going to be. Um, Probably a little, little more uh, in depth uh, on some like analytical topics. Who knows though? Maybe we'll just go off the rails and it'll be like more, more degen than the the other reps. Talk, talking about Besky's favorite drink, yeah. which is oh. probably which I'm you know the Smoking Skull. Oh, but, yeah, I, I do, a- I do love the Smoking Skull. Also love uh, the uh, Donut Shop blend. Yeah, I uh, I'll, I'll take the I'll Besky's take the blend allergic, here. So. I uh, I got beers for the pod before coming into work today. Uh, got the Deschutes IPA variety pack. I got the little squeezy, the juicy pail. I think it's all pretty fire, but I didn't get anything Besky approved. Um, got the celiacs. But yeah, but, but, but yeah, for real, like on, on, you know, on the pod for the first time, what do you think of the Smoking Skull? What do you think of the Smoking Skull drink? Did you feel it at all? Uh, what was it? I don't know. <laughs> just, it was just like, it was like six, it was like six things. I don't really know. Is the part. Yeah, like, I mean, I mean, it's, it's still it's only one cocktail. Um, I mean, if it was smoking, I think that's I think. Wait, that, when that, was that harder? When was like the first the first beer or drink you had? Um, it was. When was it like September October? Was that, it was like October because uh, 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 it was before, before reviews. Yeah. Because was that at Gators? Yeah, was that was it, that it, was when it, we were all there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's fire. H- have I been there for for uh, every time you have drank? Um, I think one time you said, or you, you had like one, one, oh yeah, you, you had like, uh, you went out with like BB Ops maybe? Um, I had a couple sips with some of the BB Ops guys, and then I actually had half of a cider on Thanksgiving, which you weren't there for. Yeah. But, but when, when, when Besky's been getting hammered though, I've been there with <laughs> But apart from that, that, I, th- that I think it's what, three, <laughs> three alcoholic <laughs> beverages you've been there for? Three out of yeah. the three point. Six two, dude. That is so crazy, because uh, when when I came back uh, full time after 2018, I was I was at this stage of still counting like 
numbers of beers and like drinks that I'd had too. Cause, cause mine was like right after grad school ended when I had my first one. So we were doing like assessment trips and I was doing the same thing yeah. where it was like, this is only like the fourth beer, you know, I've ever had. So like my, my drinking knowledge was, was pretty low. But then, but then me and Brady, uh, started going out together and, uh, he quickly <laughs> lost track. <laughs> yeah. So that, that, that's not untrue for, for sure. Um, okay. A little bit about yourselves. Who wants to go first? I think the doctor Well, does. yeah. Okay, you guys have both been on at some point. Or Was has. Mm-hmm. Besky, first appearance. First appearance. First appearance. First okay, yeah. And I wasn't on when you were on, so. So you don't know anything about him. I mean, really, really, this is your first time on the pod, you oh. know. Cause the and Lindley's first time missing it. So the he, primary he host hang, wasn't there. Hanging that over our he head. Does. Lindley's he first does. Time have you there. ever seen Kyle Lindley and I in the same podcast room? That's Ooh. true. That is very true. Yeah. Maybe the same person. Okay, tell us about who Kyle Wasserberger is. Um, he is a recent hire. Uh, came on full time in October. Worked uh, worked remotely for a few months uh, while I finished up uh, my PhD at Auburn uh, University down in Alabama. Uh, moved out here at the end of January, beginning of February. Been on site ever since, and just mainly been doing sports science stuff, doing biomech, behind the scenes stuff. Yep. Non non driveline uh, 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 things though anything big hockey guy big hockey guy that's huge lives five blocks away from us yeah five blocks away from Ca- us caravan now. found out where I lived somehow not quite sure how that happened <laughs> that's dangerous uh, and already almost broken in <laughs> that'll, that'll happen <laughs> broken um, into the yard that'll happen uh, yeah big hockey guy um, D three baseball player D three uh, Tommy John survivor yeah um, this is a good room this is a good. Had, had TJ between my senior year of high school and freshman year of college, so um, PO um, all the way in college. Not by choice. Of course. No, <laughs> definitely not. Um, played first base in high school. And oh yeah, left-handed. That makes sense. I actually bat right-handed. Oh really? Yeah, I'm one nice. of those weirdos. That's fire. You and Jerry both. What's what's up with driveline sports science and being lefty but batting righty? Jerry hits uh, yeah, right handed. Wow. Yeah. Very interesting. But he can cancel it out because he can throw with both hands. That's fair. So he's a, he's a switch thrower. Well, but he, what, he, what, he, what throw, he throws, right he throws much harder. Or not much harder. He throws harder for sure. Lefty. Yeah, like yeah. A few, like what? Like five, like five miles? Yeah. Five, yeah, six, yeah. something like that. Yeah. 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 He, I mean, he's, he's good lefty and he's, he's serviceable righty. He's but. probably how I'd put it. St. Olaf's finest. Give us a quick intro. St. Olaf's finest. I got slightly less school under my belt than was three as opposed to what ten years of college. Too many. Too many. (laughs) um, But yeah, went to St. Olaf College, played D three ball there. Um, Where's St. Olaf's at? uh, Northfield, Minnesota. 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 Yeah, sure you betcha. D three. What was the D three you went to? At the time, it was Calvin College, now it's Calvin University, which mm. makes it sound cooler, right? Nice. Um, which is in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Michigan, Minnesota, very. Honestly, there have been multiple Midwest times boys. when I've like just crossed those up. Michigan, Minnesota. Yeah, it's pretty bad. Minnesota's got all the little lakes. Michigan's got the. I've never ones. been to Minnesota. I don't feel bad about that because uh, people miss like get Idaho and Iowa like mixed Ooh. up all the time. That's or they're like, some gnarly. A bad one. You're yeah. like you're like I don't give up, I don't give I don't care because I don't care about people in those states. <laughs> <laughs> that like, dude, that's that's seventy percent of our podcast yeah, that, listeners. That they're too, all that Midwest. That too. That too. Um, anyways, yeah, uh, caught my first years in college. Pitched my last one because I couldn't hit well enough. So PO, not by uh, kind of by choice, but not really by choice. Yeah. Um, but then started at drive line September 2019. Been there since. Um, started out in CR. Um, and then kind of had opportunity to work on a couple uh, analytics projects, starting with well, this Caravan's is actually a great favorite story, yeah. Saver twenty twenty yeah. yeah presentation yeah. yeah. I was like trying to think. I was like almost. It, it, sound, it seems so long ago. It seems both so long ago and like really recent. It was, too. It was right about the the start of the podcast, actually. Yeah, yeah. But. Anyway, so yeah, well, worked on some stuff there. Um, a variety of kind of bebop type stuff. Uh, Calculated war for uh, like college baseball. Worked on building out some heat maps. Then kind of like uh, a little more than a year ago, transitioned a little to be a little bit more biomech um, heavy in terms of data analysis of that. 
uh, just naturally gravitating towards that. Um, just being like especially interested in that from having been a shitty baseball player. Yeah, it's also Wait, just like I can a cool say shitty shit. on the podcast. Oh yeah, you can say whatever okay. you want on cool. this one at least. We we well, mm, there's some guardrails <laughs> there. Most of those guardrails are for him, so you can say whatever you want. I'm not aware of any guardrails. I, I, I can say whatever I will. Say. Yeah, the, the the rules don't don't extend the same to Caravan. Yeah, I mean, uh, no no surprise wanting to get in the biomic stuff. It's just I mean, it's like it's just cool to work with. It's just fun, right? Yeah, I mean, we talk we talk a bunch about um, on this podcast and in general, we talk about like our motion capture data, and, and I think like w- one of the things maybe for listeners that aren't uh, super into weeds or, or haven't actually directly put up our data sets, I, I think it's easy to get confused between like markered, markerless, pitching biomechanics, like what ground ground reaction forces are, like all all, all these things. Um, so so I guess I'm kind of curious just for like an uh for you guys to give your thoughts and maybe intro the. The, the listeners, but uh, why don't you go first and then Besky, like what, what, how would you describe, um, if you could give us succinct, uh, and by succinct I mean, you know, under 120 seconds, I'll start you on a timer. Uh, <laughs> like how would you describe our, our, main, our main data sources on, on the biomix side? Yeah, so we get, uh, we get kinematics from the markers, right? And so you see uh, athletes get all those shiny dots placed all over them, um, and our cameras track those dots in three-dimensional space. And so we get the kinematics from that. That's how they're moving, you know, how fast, how far they move. Uh, Then with the force plates in the ground, we get the kinetic data, which is the force that the athletes are literally putting in the ground. Um, And then there's a whole other branch of biomechanics, which is EMG, which we don't have, but, or do we? But we have done before. We we don't, we don't use uh, like currently right now, but yeah, that was one of the first, uh, first papers. Somebody famous, dude. So yeah. maybe famous, those pictures of me yeah. with the EMG sensor yeah. on. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So EMG stands for electromyography, for those who aren't familiar. And yes. kind of if you take a biomechanics course in college, they kind of give it to you under those kind of three umbrellas, kinematics, kinetics, and EMG. And yeah. So we do a lot of the first two here, both in the markered lab and the markerless lab. And then we get the kinetics with the, with the force plates. Yeah, and what do you think from a data analysis, data science point of view? Like, what do you, what do you, what are you personally most excited to to work with, uh, and and or have worked with? Yeah, uh, I mean, I think the biggest thing on kind of the the biomechanics side relative to um, sort of like other data analysis um, perspectives is just that with the time series data, so we have um, each joint um, throughout the course of time of the throw, um, or like the joint angle as well as like the positions in space from each. Um, so there's just a, a variety of questions and sort of like in typical analyses, they're reduced to uh, kind of like single points in space or single points, point of interest metrics, um, whether that be at a particular time at foot plant um, or the max value. Uh, but then there's other questions that kind of are completely different from that in terms of how they get into those positions, how they kind of coordinate that Um, And so there's this whole like full time series data to kind of be able to try and extract further insights from um, that I think is really interesting. And then, I mean, it's just the numbers for how people move. So it's sort of Mm -hmm. allows you to scale the it's basically watching video on steroids Yeah, yeah. is what it is. And so being able to apply the data science to it that and just sift through massive amounts of it and it just feels super powerful. Yeah, that, that's, that's, that's actually pretty close to um, the last week, uh, I got to go down to, to UPS and, and do the do a little guest lecture to the biomechanics class there. It was pretty cool. And Oh yeah, talk, talk about a little bit. That. You, just, you just told me it went well. Yeah, uh, yeah, it, it was pretty sweet. I mean, um, shout out D3 baseball players, uh, went, to, went to UPS. Uh, Played baseball there for for one year. Puget Sound, to be clear. University of Puget Sound, yeah. Uh, that, not that's a good not, not the delivery service. Go Brown. Uh, D three, baby, yeah, the real D three. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I actually got to go down there because we have a we have a little internship pipeline set up with with Puget Sound to get some students out here and get experience in our lab. Um, so I went down, got to teach like a forty five minute hour long lecture on applied biomechanics and how how we do it, and it was it was really cool to give that perspective uh to the to the students there and one of the things that i talked about kind of like my progression of slides was like first i showed the full speed video um from behind that jared got on his iphone of when i was throwing in the lab 
and it's just like a slide progression of like going from qualitative to quantitative. So it's like your coaches, players, whatever, when they just are eyeballing mechanics, they're watching it in real time. They get, you know, the, the view from back there. And then the next one I showed is the multi uh, time synced edgertronic footage. So it's like, okay, now we have four perspectives here. They're all synchronized, a lot more frames where we can like get into stuff. Um, but we still don't really know uh, what's going on at a quantitative level. So then going from like slow-mo video into recreating a, a 3D model, like what you were talking about with the, the markers, um, we now have still that qualitative visual of like me moving in space uh, at high speed that we can move around and look at it from angles, but that's still not quali quantitative. Um, in order to actually like calculate the kinematics, get all that, now we've got joint angles, joint angular velocities, segmental rotations, all of that, where, where we can like actually put a number to how I'm moving. Uh, and then we can do like analyses, compare, you know, me versus a former version of me, a later version, all of that stuff. It was kind of just, and the, the, the main thing that I was saying or walking through was, I, I asked everyone in the room, I was like, you know, how many people are on sports teams here? How many uh, people have had their, their coach make some sort of like mechanical or movement recommendation? Um, you know, do, yes, they're skilled and trained in like whatever movement or skill you're doing and they probably have a good idea, but do they really know how you're moving? Especially in pitching, this is so fast, it's so ballistic. So me just naturally, like when I was playing, I was just like challenged uh, authority more or less in that sense and was like, why do you think that's the case? You know, like why, like you're saying that I'm doing this thing and that I need to change it to get better, you know? Like I, I understand that, but do you really know? And yeah. so biomechanical data in my mind, in terms of like how we approach it and leverage it is just like the clearest, most accurate picture of how someone is actually moving. Like if there's, there's multiple things that we can do on top of it, like really, really uh, robust and, and, and rigorous analyses and like awesome deep dives and investigations. But at the heart of it, if it just, you know, serves at the surface level to like accurately quantify movement, that's still so powerful. Like I think that alone is just like one of the most powerful aspects of, of being able to look at like movement and biomechanical data. W w one thing to actually, um, haven't really talked to you, you guys about before, um, but I think it's really interesting, especially from the point of view of like kind of an outsider uh, perspective, me, like I don't have a traditional biomechanics background. I've worked with a lot of biomechanics data. Uh, and I know like a bit about the limitations and constraints and everything, but do you guys have any thoughts or concerns about as people, as like baseball teams and colleges start getting their own biomechanics lab, um, not they're not being any like one universal model to allow mapping <laughs> over of uh, oh oh starting off with a softball okay. yeah yeah <laughs> well I mean I mean I, I was gonna I was gonna say like a pretty a pretty easy example is uh, Wass's Auburn model, um, which you know. You, you did for your dissertation, and then obviously... Not my model. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Trademark. Uh, Auburn, Wasserberg, model. <laughs> Wasserberg invented the model that all yeah. of Auburn public case are currently using. Uh, Wasserberg at all. But yeah, I, I guess I'll just leave it open in on that. Uh, yeah, what are you guys' thoughts on that? And any way to like eventually centralize and have it all tied down to like some core model? And I mean, I would just expand upon that further with like what are the modeling decisions that go into that? Cause I don't think that's immediately clear. It's like, yeah. sure we have the dots, mm -hmm. but like, yeah. how would people get di different? Yeah, 47 Numbers, markers, that, for 470, 470 4,700. Yeah. yeah, like how, how do you end up with different results based on modeling choices? Yeah, I mean, I've got a, like, Was and I have had talks uh, about this, just like, I mean, I remember, I remember during the summer, podcast, baby. Dur during the summer, just like sitting and just like complaining about how, how frustrating um, that situation is. I think that's one of the things that in conversations with you uh, and others that I definitely wanted to like try to explain because um, there's with biomechanical data, there's a lot of nuances and limitations and it at face value, it's easy to just, well, it's hard to know those at all. Like even, even being a, a trained biomechanist in terms of like getting the education, it's like still really complex stuff. But it's important to know those nuances 
when you're trying to interpret the data because it's really easy to just like look at the numbers at face value and be like this is fact this mm -hmm. is what it is um so th th there are a lot of uh intricacies i'm actually very down to uh hear, 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 hear your thoughts on this yeah doctor yeah well, I mean, so you, you asked about what are the modeling decisions that go into like between different labs and probably the two that come to mind are how are we defining the joint centers, particularly because we're throwing and we're talking about the shoulder. How you define the shoulder joint center is just a snake's nest right off the bat. Yep. And then, but on top of that, it's how you, how and when you decide to filter your marker data. Mm -hmm. um, because you can filter at the very first level when you're just looking at the posi position over time. You can then do your signal uh, computations to get joint torques, velocities, accelerations, whatever, and then filter again, or you can't, or you don't. Yeah. And then even on top of, so that would be the when. So like, do you just filter once? Do you filter twice? Whatever. But then, what do you filter at? Because uh, you, if you read, you know, ten different baseball biomechanics papers, here's an ASMI one, here's a Wake Forest one, here's a driveline one, whatever. Yep. You could come up with as many different filtering cutoff frequencies for your filter than there are papers. Yeah. And um, even if we uh, if we take the same raw position data and lab A filters it at thirteen point four, right? 13.4, and then we filter whatever. it at 20 yeah. and especially when you're extracting local peaks like the peak values are going to be extremely sensitive yeah. to that cutoff frequency yeah. so you see lab a reports peak elbow extension velo of 2500 degrees per second and, and we report it as 2900 degrees per second mm -hmm. there may in fact not be any actual difference yeah. in the under, could be the same in the underlying movement it could be yep. it, it could be the exact same, same thing but just we had a higher cutoff frequency they had a lower yeah. one you know they filtered it twice we filtered it it only at the beginning or vice versa yeah. so those are the two biggest modeling decisions that uh come to mind when you're talking about introducing between lab or between setup differences mm -hmm. Also, I mean, the, I would I would add in the third of um, the decisions around pose estimation for for six to off or um, you know limiting well, limiting the amount of degrees of fingers. Six to off is a well, actually, Wash should describe six to off because a lot of the conversations that we had this summer were around how um, at Auburn you guys use a, a six to off. Uh, model. model, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, yeah Wass's model at, at Auburn, the, the six off pose estimation, whereas our biomechanical data has always been a two uh, a two chain um, IK linkages inverse kinematics uh, model. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, you want to try to try to explain what a, okay. what a six off model um, is? Yeah. So basically. Six degrees of freedom. DOF. DOF. Yeah. That, six that, doff. That, that got me the other day. You guys were saying six doff. I googled like yeah. six doff. Oh. X I S I X. It sounds like a it sounds like a rapper. And I'm just like, who is who is who is? It sounds like a cross with my or something else. Yeah. It either sounds like a drug or some like underground hip hop artist. Six doff on the mic. Six doff on the mic right here, dude. So for you. BB ops people, these are, I mean, it's kind of like statistical degrees of freedom, yeah. I guess. Mm -hmm. um, but the way we use it in biomechanics means if I have six degrees of freedom, that means I'm free to translate and rotate in all three planes of motion, right? Yeah. So if you think about my shoulder, when I move my shoulder, I can rotate it any which way and I can, you know, if I move my shoulder girdle as a whole, I can kind of translate it in, in any which way. Versus if I move my elbow, I can't take my elbow and like move it as freely as my shoulder, right? Because the bony geometry of my forearm and upper arm kind of. You need to off your shirt for this, dude. You gotta <laughs> see that elbow. Kind of res no. <laughs> restrict my elbow to only moving in this, uh, you know, single plane of motion, right? And so we would say my shoulder has more degrees of freedom than my elbow. Mm -hmm. And when we say a uh, full sixed off model, it, that means that our software is treating each body segment in our entire model as completely free to move relative to the other segments, right? And so 
um, versus a non-six DAW where uh, we constrain in the software, we say, hey, elbow, you can't actually like Dislocate. translate way this way, Yep. right? Which sounds great in practice, but then when you get into certain pose estimation problems, we can yeah. get stuck with, uh, stuck in minima where the pose estimation algorithm actually says, well, actually you can do that, Yeah. yeah. right? And, and so it's kind of like what, what lumps are you willing to take mm -hmm. with the respective approach? Yeah, and so getting back to kind of the thing you were talking about, like biomechanics getting more popular, there's gonna be more labs, all this stuff. There really isn't a, okay, I'm actually not gonna say that. There is a body out there that establishes like ASMR. standards, uh, ISBS, uh, like the ISBS standards, at least as far ISB as I know. A ASB, ISBS, right? Like, ISB standards. Yeah, yeah, the ISB standards. Like, as I know it, that's like the most commonly used. Like, if you're trying to figure out, yeah, yeah, you can go there. Yeah. The, the, there are like massive documents online and resources for like how to model and define joint centers and then like their recommendations on things. And that's fine. But one of the, after, after going through like l really diving into understanding modeling, pose estimation, and, and all of that stuff, I more or less came to a conclusion, actually with a lot of help from you and like conversations with you about this kind of stuff, that like domain experience matters more than what is, you know, deemed academically correct by this like yeah. governing body in ISB. Like this is by no means I'm saying that- This is basically like the CDC of yeah, biomechanics. Yeah, like, by no means I'm not saying that you should like go against what, what ISB recommends, but one of the best additions to our lab now is the edutronic data that we're getting, the high speed mm -hmm. qualitative video, because you can really see how the segments are moving in the video and cross-reference that to like the biomechanical models. So you can know if, if one model where you have like the shoulder defined in a certain area or certain markers defining a certain segment, you can just look at that video and be like, okay, that's, that's not actually happening. Which to be honest with everyone is like what we have found in some of our biomechanical data. Like that's why we're actually trying to move to uh, a newer model that we feel more confident accurately is like representing the movement uh, of the humerus, the movement of the torso the whole time. I think one of the most exciting things is um, historically we have used an inverse uh, kinematics. kinematics linkage chain for like the upper body. Specifically, the shoulder is constrained to the torso in some fashion. That affects the way that like torso movements are are measured in the lab because like if you put constraints on how the shoulder, how the elbow can move and how these segments can move, um, you're, you're just because of the nature of the pitching motion, getting into like extreme ranges of motion and moving really fast, uh, these models are gonna solve and say like, okay, the arm can't be there unless the torso is like slightly shifted. So you see the, the peak signals and movements maybe get dampened and then they're like exaggerated elsewhere. But what we're doing with our model now is like, the torso and pelvis specifically, we're just treating them as like six degrees of freedom, individual segments. They can like translate and rotate in space. Um, you know, they're not, they're not linked to any other segments. So we feel better about like getting a little more accurate there. And during this process of, of doing this, I mean, I was having combos with WASS like borderline daily, like rolling in and just like flipping through biomechanics books and being like, what did you guys do? What do we do? I don't even know, like I'm just losing my mind because each time I make a decision, there's a trade off elsewhere. And yeah. I think finally just got like worn down to a point where it was like, we just got to make a decision that we feel good about. Because each time I would try to like look up research or see something or go into a paper and see how they define the model. Mm -hmm. And then I would try that and like there was the, there's almost like an element of like imposter syndrome that I was going through where I was like, I'm trying, I'm like Jimmy rigging these things that not a lot of other people are doing, but 
this works. And then when I go to the literature, they're saying that you need to do it like that. And then when we do that, it doesn't look good. Like yeah, it doesn't but, look yeah. right. And that, that's because the literature is based on 98% of people walking. <laughs> exactly. That's, that's actually like the biggest problem is that a oh, lot of these, off gate analysis. Uh, yeah, yeah a lot of the, a lot of the like recommendations and stuff are, are based on the most popular field in biomechanics, which is just like gate, you know, other normal even, but like even jogging processes. or even yeah. jogging or, or running, like you're still extremely uniplanar mm -hmm. and not even, I mean, I guess in sprinting, you kind of get close to some end ranges in, in the hips and knees yeah. maybe, but, but like still, yeah. nothing, I think to pitching. Yeah. Yeah. Nothing it's like the, the, uh, rotation range mm -hmm. of motion, uh, particularly in the torso and the shoulder, like, yeah. Exactly. So it just got to a point where it was like, I don't know if this is right. I, I like really don't, but like, I don't, I also don't know if there's anyone else in this field that has like the amount of data. There might be a handful on, right? the, on, the, on the population too. Yeah. The, the, the population. There's like maybe a handful of people that have the, the amount of data and stuff that we have and have been able to like work with over over a period of time the amount of like biomechanical data and stuff that we've worked with so like i do feel some element of like we can just make a call here and run with it you know and, and if if at some point someone sees it and and, and they're like mm, that doesn't look right or it doesn't follow these standards it's like we've got our our like our athlete results as kind of our forever shield against that at least in my, you know that's how i've been looking at it to kind of like get over my own uh, I internal imposter syndrome about uh, these uh, kind of decisions. I was going to say, as, as a quick note, a, a funny tangent on, on you and leafing through books and imposter syndrome. I remember a couple weeks ago when your girlfriend was over and she was like trying to roast you on uh, just having a big calculus textbook. She's like, who who look, like who looks through those textbooks? And you're like, me, on a daily basis. I'm double checking what I'm doing. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it was so funny. Yeah, it's pretty bad. Uh, yeah, I have all my like college textbooks and stuff but like i still do that all the time in the trivia. yeah i still like, do that all the time with like uh the, the <laughs> research methods in biomechanics i mean i've i've aggressively leafed through that probably i don't want to say it's done more harm than good like uh, a lot of the foundational knowledge i have is around that but there have definitely been way too many times where i've just looked through that book and been like well this is how they did it this is how we have to do it you know uh, and so getting away from that is, has kind of been nice. It's a bit scary, but I think it's, I'm pretty excited about where we're going with it for sure. What, what, do, you, what do you think from working with, uh, I mean, you know, a, a fuck ton of data, which is soon to be about a, a fuck ton squared tons of data. Once we get through the V5 and V6 pipelines, yeah. um, or V6, uh, what are some, what are some takeaways? Like if someone was going to like sit down. If, if someone, you know, goes through, says about R&D lab or, or biomech lab, gets a bunch of data, they're sitting down, they're ready to analyze it. Like, what, what would you recommend to people first, like, you know, dive in deep? What are some things to consider? What are some, some things to look at right away? Uh, what, any, any words of advice to, for people to look at other look, working with biomech data? Yeah. Um, I mean, I think part of it is um, sort of understanding what's going on with the data. Having some idea of movement is yeah. just super helpful. Um, especially uh, if you're if you're looking at like metrics which are like collinear, um, I I mean I think the the starting point is yeah figuring out some sort of point of interest metrics which is going to be dependent upon um, some review of like existing literature yeah. like yeah. in in pitching usually whatever like peak knee height foot plant ball standardized release. events yep standardized yeah. events because um, otherwise if you just start with the the full signals. Um, like, I mean, I, I think that's something that we've done uh, really well is kind of simplifying the data to be able to apply it, mm -hmm. to apply it to an extent that, that no one else yeah. really has yeah. to, to my knowledge. Yeah. Um, and so like there, there's more, um, more uh, potential there to kind of dive deep and like build out increasingly complex, yeah. better models. Um, but like the the biggest bang for the buck is the the simple stuff. What kind of stands out even in, in simple analyses. So kind of start simple. I, I think is a big thing. Kind of uh, definitely explore the data to understand kind of um, 
uh, collinearity between different things because like you might think you're measuring one thing but it actually just like yeah. um, what's a good example oh like COG velocity yeah. it's like okay how fast is he moving down the mountain Highly correlated yep. with stride length. Yeah. Makes yeah. sense. Right. But right. just like, if, if you don't kind of check for those relationships, it, it's kind of, uh, or checking for those relationships, I feel like it's super helpful for like contextualizing what each metric means. So um, just like anytime it's like trying to come up with a new metric, I always think of like, all right, like what could be confounding this? Like, yeah. are, are there certain segments of the population that just, are biased and always have this metric be larger or yeah. heavier athletes always more efficient. Or, Why'd you look or, at me? <laughs> <laughs> what is that? No comment. Unav- <laughs> unavailable for comment. Why'd you, why'd what you say heavy athletes and you looked over here? Where'd you put Fat your, tails. where'd you put your Zod? Hey, dude? 226 today. All right. I'll have hey. you know. No, yeah, wait, wait, but he's still hiding a mod pizza right, <laughs> right behind. 226 today. I think it's back there now. Yeah. I got pizza to finish after this. Um, Sorry. Yeah, so stuff like that. Um, another one I think is just like super interesting on those lines is like MER, like yeah. how, how much time they have or how, mm. like the relationship of like time, the arm going into MER, torque, yeah. uh, just like all kind of being confounded by the range of motion they reach in that. Because if they, if they have an extra, uh, say, 20 degrees for like an extreme comparison to go, like they're going to spend more time. They're potentially yeah. whatever going to be able to generate more for like our efficiency metrics, um, which would be just like how much velocity they're able to generate relative to the torque on their elbow, um, controlling for like body weight as well. Um, it's just like MER crops up there as like a confounding variable, and it's like this is interesting. I mean, it's it's, yeah. it's a interesting observation. Good to know, um, but also like. You want to make sure, if that's not what you're trying to capture, you want to make sure that you're kind of understanding yeah. how, how different things are interplaying and, mm-hmm. and what could be confounding there. That's a good point. I was going to say, um, yeah, kind of, what, kind of what Besky's saying, but I would say, like, making sure you know what you're looking for. Like, if you're trying to develop players like we are, like, what metrics, not only what metrics, like, correlate or explain the most variation and veal or metric we care about, but, like, which ones are ones you can actually train. Yeah. Like, okay, like, Max shoulder internal rotation, like how fast your shoulder moves. Okay, great, but like, what are what mm-hmm. are the actual ones we think we can change through through drills and want to attack versus just like throwing everything in blender and seeing the what has the highest correlation? Yeah, I had a weird, um, a, a pretty weird thought the other day um, about like all the all the biomechanics research has kind of been done up to this point um, and how that's going to influence a lot of these new labs mm-hmm. and people who are starting to get into like pitching hitting baseball biomechanics and whatnot you know and walking through the thought experiment of like if for some reason all the literature on like mathematics and physics just was gone right eventually the same principles would would like come to light through science right like we would eventually get to the same mathematical like truths and and proofs right so like if you did the same thought experiment applied to baseball biomechanics specifically i wonder if with the amount of now labs and stuff that are popping up people who are getting interested in it high level athletes throwing in these would we come to the same sort of Mm -hmm. of principles because it drove a lot of previous research drove where we looked, you know, the idea of the kinematic sequence, the idea of, mm-hmm. of, of just sequencing in general of like, um, you know, uh, m- segments moving rotationally uh, in certain planes, you know, why certain metrics are more important, even just the way that events and stuff are defined, right? That is, it goes back to seminal research done, you know, well before, I mean, uh, you know, in the 80s and 90s and whatnot. So if all of that didn't exist and there was just like a lab that did biomechanics research, would we come to the same kind of conclusions? I think that's 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 the thing I'm most excited about, about V6 and now having a, a really robust data set um, that, that we can play with across, across levels. And we got longitudinal data. Like uh, I'm almost down to, to try to break a lot of those norms, you know, that that we think are fact or, or, you know, models of, of pitching mechanics specifically. Um, yeah. Well, one thing you mentioned, I think it would be cool to like kind of talk to, uh, talk about, and then have some listeners maybe, you know, 
give feedback on or, or just like learn from uh, this conversation. Uh, you mentioned labeling events. So, so in the pitching motion, that, that kind of centers mostly around, I mean, important ones are foot plant, yeah. uh, ball release, MER, uh, anything else you, you guys think like is, is worth like talking about or bringing up from, a, from an applied sense? And, and, and also, do you guys, we should talk about how like, how that impacts how you actually compare numbers, right? Like wh what does it mean to identify events? How do you compare yeah. when normalizing between those events? Yeah. I mean, I think the the traditional like phases and event definitions are that it's like you've got your I don't even know what the first one's like traditionally called. Oh, stride phase, you know, like leg lift to foot plant. And then you've got Usually uh, it's early, arm, early arm cocking. Yeah, yeah. Early cocking or something is like foot plant to lay back. Uh, or foot plant to like 90 or flat yeah, or something, and then it's late, yeah. late cocking. Late cocking is into, into MER, and then... Late cocking is what I was doing last night, dude. <laughs> God damn it. The driveline phase. <laughs> yeah, driveline, driveline phase from, from MER into ball release, and then deceleration from ball release to, to MIR. Um, that, that's the one I'll take issue with. Yeah. I mean, they, they make sense. When you look at like what they were doing, and and the reasons behind it, it's like yeah we need you just look at how gate research came about which is like we need events we need like i mean first rocker second rocker third you know toe on mm -hmm. heel off all those you need standardized events that like everyone in the population does in the movement you know to to look at it um but yeah i, I think there's definitely room to foot plant i think is a is a solid one yeah you know? because foot it's, plant, it's so, foot contact foot strike yeah. Weight bearing. There, there's so many ways to, I guess, just look at that that alone. Right. Because be, there could be several frames depending on what your FPS is. Yeah. There's yeah. tons of different striking patterns. Some yeah. people land on their toe, yeah. Yeah. midfoot, heel, all that. Yeah. I think there's a lot of lot on the, um, yeah. the definition side. I think there's only only so many. Like you were saying, like if we lost all knowledge about baseball biomechanics, I'm I'm fairly confident the main event signals would still come through because like yeah. there's only like you asked me to break down the phases of a squat for example like there's the bottom of the squat there's the top like the, yeah you, like you got the eccentric phase and the concentric yeah, like phase the, you, you can only do so much before you're just salading yourself yeah you know? and so i think that would still kind of kind of ring through for sure um the one that i've seen or that I noticed, uh, especially when we're looking at energy flow, is that MIR usually mm. isn't long enough mm. in terms of a decel phase. Because, um, and we, we got a paper out uh, last year about how um, if you're looking at like shoulder IR torque, for example, yeah, that gets really low by, M by MIR. And so if, you, if you're just looking at shoulder rotation torque, for mm -hmm. example, you see, oh, it's pretty minimal following ball release. There must not be that uh, much stress on the shoulder at that point. But if you ask any player or coach or AT or PT, yeah. uh, y you'll hear that, you know, D-cell injuries are crazy. And like, right. it's super tough on like your posterior shoulder capsule and whatever. And so like, we're missing something there and actually mm -hmm. when you just don't look at when you look at more than just shoulder rotation torque and you look at the entire joint moment or the entire joint force or both at the same time in energy flow you actually see following mir there's like this big not as big as the peaks during cocking but um there's this big swell in joint loads mm -hmm. following mir as the athlete slows down and brings their arm across and if we just look at shoulder rotation and elbow valgus we miss that yeah so yeah see that 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 is the kind of stuff that if if there was a world where you know you didn't have the the previous stuff what kind of where you know what what fresh ideas or takes could we kind of like you know roll down to to get better answers and stuff i, ju I just get worried that a lot of the a lot of the previous research has kind of like pointed us in in certain directions, yep. um, and so it's hard to look at those and just be like, you know, you're, you're trying, by this. yeah, you're trying to form fit the investigations into yeah. what's already known, you know, in, in the area instead of instead of kind of going rogue, which which I think is like what I mean, we yeah. should do. A lot of those studies are based off probably that population with average below what like. 
Oh, so that would not I, even. I mean, that'd yeah. be impressive. Yeah, yeah, that'd so, be impressive. I mean, that that's the other thing is it's like have to kind of calibrate. and lower fidelity data. Yep, I kind like of have to DLT stuff manually digita- digitized, calibrate and weight, whatever various yeah. study results in, exactly. in light of those kind of qualifiers. Yeah, everyone everyone always always falls back on the. Uh, the the arm internally rotates at speeds up to nine thousand degrees per second. I mean, I in my thesis. I'm pretty sure I have papers that say that exact same. Yeah, thing. in my I, under my own name. I, I do too. <laughs> on, on your Google Scholar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm pretty sure in the intro of my my thesis at UPS, I quoted both of those. You know, yeah. and I used it. I was like, yeah, the arm can internally rotate at speeds up to nine thousand degrees per second, and. Uh, I mean, we've definitely never seen 7,000, and we've got some of the fastest throwers in the world coming through our lab. I don't. At like 5,000 or I something, right? I don't think we've seen 6,000. I want to say I've seen a couple fives. What do we currently have in the, in the V60V? I, don't know. Is, I mean, they're like f- around the 42 to 45 yeah, yeah, yeah. for the, for the peak I guys. Yeah. I think... I think we had some 5,000ers in some, some earlier models. I don't know if we have any right now, but... Still, I mean, we've seen we've seen hundred mile an hour pitches, and they don't rotate at nine thousand degrees per second. Also, peak IR speeds, the way they happen, everyone always likes to give the example of the arm at ninety. You know, and like, yeah, the arm rotates like this. No maximal IR speed is happening when their arm is at ninety degrees. It is like it's here. You know, yeah. they're the elbows like, right following ball release. Yeah, the elbow is almost fully extended. Like everyone likes to pair and. When I say everyone, I'm actually talking to a former version of myself when I talked about how, like, you know, look at look at how much layback they get and all this, and then he's going to get in this position, and then he's going to rotate at 9,000 degrees per second out of it. That's not true. The arm's going to deploy, like, in this, you know, almost like lasso fashion. It's like whipping out uh, in interrelease, and that's when that, that peak IR speed happens. Not, you know. One thing you guys mentioned, uh, energy flow, which we, we have some new metrics on energy flow that we didn't have recently. And we, I think we've taken some measures to kind of calculate, like, you know, some more stuff going, uh, going forward there. Do you guys want to explain what that is and, and why we're interested in it? I know Wasp <laughs> wants to explain what that is. I'm just trying to throw up softballs. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so, um, base, so we usually uh, want to quantify the loads placed on the pitching arm, right? Obviously, on the shoulder and elbow. And traditionally that's been mainly Elbow valgus torque or varus torque, depending on how that's you're, a good topic right you're after defining this. things, internal, external, whatever. And then it's uh, it's complement at the shoulder, which is shoulder internal or external rotation torque. And basically, to calculate those, we calculate the net joint moment on the shoulder and elbow, and then we take one part of that net joint moment that we think has anatomical relevance, right? So the UCL, it's on the inside of the elbow, it's gonna be most vulnerable to torques about that axis that causes valgus, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Stress. Oh, yeah, stress, sir. Sure. Um, uh, that causes valgus stress at the elbow, uh, but there's other um, components of that net joint torque that are not traditionally looked at like they were in the early papers right but then everyone kind of just keys in on elbow valgus and for good reason because it yeah. has anatomical relevance to the ucl and then yeah, it makes sense we do the same thing on the shoulder um but the point being there's there are other joint loads uh at both the shoulder and elbow that we're not looking at and what energy flow does is it takes the entire uh, net joint moment or net joint force um you know kind of takes it into the garage, sands it down, uh, puts a bow on it, brings it back out in one number, and that's kind of a amalgamation of your entire joint stress, mm. kind of. Um, and uh, kind of like what I was talking about with looking at, looking beyond MIR and seeing big increases in, in shoulder joint stress, we can actually look at the energy going from the upper arm to the forearm during the pitching motion and it we hope again we're still in kind of the early stage of this uh give us a bit more complete picture of what your elbow is being exposed to or your shoulder uh during the pitching motion and so 
Um, it's kind of new, but not new because it was done in walking in the 80s, like everything yeah. else in biomechanics. But in terms of applying it to the pitching motion, um, really just probably since 2018, at least in English. Again, there are papers in out of Japan before this because they beat us to everything yeah. in, in the baseball biomechanics world. But they always do. in terms of stateside, um, like uh, Jacob Howenstein, uh, Dr. Aguinaldo started putting out some papers. Uh, a couple other labs have started putting out some papers looking at these energy flow metrics. Um, and I hope that's kind of like a, a next little yeah you know rabbit hole to go down but uh pretty excited doing some preliminary investigations actually in the middle of doing a write-up right now um showing that uh elbow energy transfer and elbow valgus can kind of be complementary and at least in a predictive sense where if you include them both in a model it gets you further than yeah. just one by itself yeah and it's not like one dwarfs the other and the other one becomes a, a non-significant predictor like yeah. they, they can kind of help each other out and so i'm pretty optimistic that um at least to some extent it's going to bring some added information yeah that that's that's kind of one of the things i was talking about too with like um new newer ways to approach things i think uh it's actually kind of similar to um a convo i had had with dean at some point and i know that that others have have talked about and now gotten more interested in but like uh you know hip shoulder separation just doesn't only happen in the Z, right? There's like, there's other uh, orientations that it happens in. You have like anterior, posterior, medial lateral stuff. So that that's kind of stuff I was talking about with um, getting away from, you know, historically people say like hip shoulder separation is really important, but there there's other components and like looking at, you know, getting out of just like the XYZ coordinate system into, which is, as you're kind of getting X at floating YZ. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but as you, as you're kind of getting at, like, that's one of the things with like, uh, various valgus and just looking at like one piece of it. Um, so any analysis that I, that looks into other components or, or tries to, what would you say? Uh, sand it down and get it in the amalgamation of all of them. Yeah. Put, on it. put a bow on it. Yeah. Got to paint a picture for the list. Exactly. Yeah. You don't, know? don't just get the Z or, or one component, but, uh, get all of it together. I, I think like those types of analyses are, are super exciting for sure. What, what, uh, what investigations are, are you most pumped to get into? Um, yeah. So, I mean, the big thing with kind of the, the pipeline we do in addition to some of like the modeling changes, um, we're also just exporting more metrics. Um, so we do have kind of the energy flow stuff um, that, that was added to there. Uh, but then we're also exporting like the joint position. So previously we just had the joint angles. Um, so just had the, the joint of like, or the angle of elbow flexion um, throughout the course of a throw. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah. now we have the X, X, XYZ coordinates um, in space for the wrist, the elbow and the shoulder at each point. Um, so that gives us a little bit more stuff to work with, um, just because in some cases the the joint angles it can be a little bit tough to kind of put into uh, put into the signals what it is you're looking for kind of visually, mm -hmm. um, which I mean I, I think that that's part of why I think I really gravitated to like the biomech analysis was the the challenge and kind of uh, involved in translating the movement to the data and, yeah. and to kind of framing framing the question um that you can kind of intuitively understand video, from the video into what it actually looks like in the data so um i mean examples i i think like the back foot would be tough to look at from just the joint angles like say back heel connection um because you could look at the ankle like dorsi plantar flexion mm -hmm. but that's affected by if they're bending their knee or not. So knee like flexion. knee, knee yeah, I'm sorry flexion. for people, anyone listening to this episode, just fucking Googling. If, if they've been as far, they're pulling out different tabs and just yeah. dorsiflexion. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, basically, you could bend at the ankle, you could bend at the knee, you could bend at the hip. Like if, if you were to just like bend your leg, all of those would kind of mm -hmm. happen together, um, which ties into like the coordination kind of aspect of, of the full signal data, which is um, kind of like a, a taller analysis task. Um, but with the, with the positional data in there, we can now just 
straight up look at the position of the foot. So when does the foot come off the ground yeah. with, without having to kind of try and reverse engineer stuff from, from just working with the joint angles. So yeah. um, I, I think there's a variety of stuff along those lines. Um, force plate data is also um, processed and more accessible. Um, we've been collecting it, but just haven't kind of built out all, all the pipelines to have it flowing into the DB um, until recently. So a bunch of stuff to look at there in terms of like timing of ground reaction forces, kind of coordination with, with other movements. Um, as well as just understanding like what movements relate to putting force into the ground yeah. um, mm -hmm. and yeah. other stuff along those lines. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Another thing with the, uh, the joint center stuff that I think is pretty exciting long term is um, since Hawkeye doesn't do uh, orientation, segment orientation, it just is like joint center data. There, there is a lot of potential for like I think those kind of investigations or getting, I think this is going to happen with markerless too, because like there's a lot of assumptions or ways that uh, segment orientation is, is estimated based on like models and whatnot. And I think that labs, companies, whoever's out there, like, I don't know who's going to win that battle for which model's best or which way to like do the pose estimation and, and uh, interpretation of those, those orientations. Um, but one thing that they'll all have that's like accurate with markerless data is the joint center positions. You know, you may not be able to know, like you're probably just not going to be able to solve, you know, pronation, supination and like forearm carry angle, all that stuff with markerless data. I don't know how you would be able to do that, but you should get high fidelity joint center data from markerless solutions. And so if you can build out some robust analyses around, hey, you don't have joint angles and you don't have uh, the ability to like break down the components in, in that sense, but you do have joint center positions, velocity, acceleration, and space, you know, what kind of um, data can can you get from that and understanding and then how can you apply it to the to the athlete i think it's pretty interesting there's a chance too that that might be easier to interpret for the athlete than uh you know standard joint angles like when you say shoulder horizontal abduction they're just like yeah what, is, what does that mm. mean right like maybe maybe there is potential for just um you know joint center based analyses that get away from traditional biomech talk might be might be easier to interpret and i think with markerless stuff it'll be pretty pretty important so i got, got a couple minutes here left what, what what's your number one uh recommendation if someone's starting a biomechanics lab you guys go first <laughs> based on all my experience starting biomechanics labs and my mine's gonna be don't oh no, i'm just <laughs> damn i should have taken that mine was gonna be don't Unless you're willing to pay for a human that knows how to run things, because a yeah. lot, a lot of entities like to, they're more than willing to spend six figures on toys, and then mm -hmm. they want to yeah. try and get, you know, someone for not very much money to yeah. to run the whole thing, you know, and buy themselves. And that's one of the things that I really like about here is that, yeah, we have the toys, but we also have a lot of people. Yeah, and yeah. so you know, it, it it takes a village, and so don't be. Um, I get that the equipment's kind of like just an upfront cost, but it for the most part is kind of a one-time thing assuming nothing breaks too much yeah. but like and the the human cost is recurring because you got to keep paying them but like there's really minimal point in buying all that stuff if you're not willing to also pony up for you know qualified people who who can understand it yeah i think one quick thing to add on to that um which has happened to us multiple times in like in like meetings, potential contract purchases, all this stuff, like people, like teams, facilities, whomever out there want to build their own biomic lab and, and get it running and, and stuff, which is great. But it's going to take a while for them to, to yeah, settle too. on a model, get enough data to actually get any sort of insight out of it. Yeah. And like start up, like, you know, like build yeah. a, a pipeline or something to, to yeah. apply it. You got like, to have, have a plan for like the end state yeah. of like, what's it actually going to do? Yeah. You just, are you just collecting data? Um, I like I like Wass's answer a lot, which would I'll, I'll go with mine being the same thing. My uh, the first lecture I ever had in grad school in our like first uh, biomed class, professor said just like opened it up with um, 
first slide, first line, which is biomechanics is 90% troubleshooting. So, you, you know, we're going to talk a lot about all the nitty gritty like math and stuff that goes into how we actually get biomechanical data. And it's important for you to know, but at the end of the day, the most important thing you're going to get from like this lab experience here is to know what to do when stuff breaks and what isn't working. So honestly, I learned a lot about like really in-depth biomechanics stuff, but the, the, the stuff I'm most grateful for in terms of learning was just like problem solving when things break. Uh, cause biomechanics just like, it is not by biomechanics lab, press record, have biomechanics data. Like it's st stuff is breaking all the time. You got to figure out and, you know, understand how to solve things, make decisions around those problems, all that. What, what you got, Besky? Besky. What is a biomechanics lab? Um, that's a good, I mean, that, that's a good answer no, right I, there. I, yeah, I, I feel that expresses my knowledge on uh, what it takes to start one. I mean, thankfully we have a team that, that handles the lab. So in terms of like that stuff, there's a whole bunch of it that, I mean, with, with working on some of the processing stuff, I've gained more of an appreciation for, but just like, shoot, like there's a lot that goes from taking or capturing dots yeah. to yeah. then having numbers for someone. Yeah. From that's again. that's just getting that's just getting data. That's not yeah. even the the other piece which is probably bigger, which is actually doing something yeah. with it. You know, like how are you gonna actually use this? What what's your plan for getting it in athletes' hands and, and making the changes you want, that kind of stuff. Which I mean is is a is a question that pops up in a bunch of parallel baseball. All, yeah. all baseball Pitch design, technology things. Is, yeah, bad yeah. speed, looking at blast data, KVS, all that. 100%. Pulse workload. Pulse, 100%. Pulse ratios. Pulse ratios. We're, we're out of time. Oh, baby. we're out of time. We're we're out of time. time. Oh, no. <laughs> we can't even get into ratios. Uh, it's 5 o'clock. Uh, do we got to go? I was, no, what do you got? We I, got I, I was just going to add, two. I feel like that, that system part of it is just super helpful with, like, because the, the data collection efforts that, that actually, like, continue to – that to get poured into and like used are the ones where there is an output yeah where, where there are decisions that are made based off of it that's when the people keep coming back indefinitely yeah. to collect more data and to uh just continue to use it to to build out pipelines to pour that's resources into it. it if it kind of is going into a black box it can be super tough so like that's the other thing is like try and find the quickest turnaround to it doesn't have to be the greatest thing in the world, but to have some sort of output and like factor into decision making or, or whatever um, yeah. from your system. That's a really good point. That's a really good point. So my any question is was gonna be which one is uh, which one of the, uh, Wasis tattoos is your guys' favorite? Uh, we'll save that for the next uh, <laughs> the, ne the, the next for time we have this, the next time we have this group on because uh, we got to run to all hands. Post all hands. Really OC is gonna be pissed. Uh, Drive on R and D podcast episode seventy two three three. Mm -hmm. he, thought, said, he said seventy three at the start, yeah. so you might two, have two to jigs. record another one. Two Are jigs. you sure two is jigs? No, but but but, but, but was us, Seventy was Nick Martinez. Seventy two was jigs. Or seventy one was jigs. This is seventy two. I think this is seventy two. How do we do it? Podcast episode 74. Podcast episode 72. Uh, yeah, thanks Thanks for coming on. Thanks for coming on, guys. Thanks for having me. Yeah. We'll do it again. We'll do it again soon. Peace. 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 Peace.